This Qantas 747 was on approach to a very stormy Bangkok International Airport. It crossed the threshold of the runway a little bit high and fast, and as it did so, the pilots noticed that the weather and the visibility was getting worse. The captain then informed the first officer to go around, but then just one second later, the captain put his hand on the first officer's hand, which was now on the thrust levers, and retarded the thrust levers. What he didn't notice was the first officer's hand was only covering the thrust levers for engine two, three, and four. Therefore, thrust lever number one remained in its position of go around thrust. This, along with many other factors, led to what happened next. This is the story of Qantas One, a Boeing 747-400, which was flying from Sydney, Australia, all the way to London in the UK. To fly this distance, they had to stop along the route to refuel. And for this route, they would be stopping at Bangkok International Airport, which was estimated to take about eight hours and 28 minutes. There were 391 passengers on board, 16 cabin crew, and three flights crew consisting of a captain, a first officer, and a second officer. All three were very experienced pilots. The date was the 23rd of September, 1999, all the passengers boarded the aircraft and settled in for their long flight to Bangkok International Airport. The startup and taxi all proceeded normally. Then at 4.47 local time, the Boeing 747-400, also known as the Queen of the Skies, took off and climbed to its cruising altitude of flight level 350. The rest of the trip proceeded normally, and before commencing their descent into Bangkok, the crew obtained the Bangkok Airport weather information. This stated that the wind was from 240 degrees at 10 knots, visibility was 9 kilometers, and it was raining at the airport and there were thunderstorms in the area. This wasn't uncommon for Bangkok at this time of year, and the crew had landed several times at Bangkok International Airport in very similar weather. The first officer, who was the pilot flying, then briefed the rest of the crew on their approach and landing. Now, Bangkok International has two parallel runways, two one right and two one left, the first officer then briefed the crew that he'll be flying an ILS on 2-1 right. The flight crew then secured themselves into their appropriate seats with the captain in the left-hand seat, the first officer in the right-hand seat, and the second officer in the first observer seat. And his wife, the second officer's wife, was in the second observer seat. It was noted that her presence in the flight deck didn't adversely affect any aspect of this flight. So at 16 minutes past 10, Qantas 1 then commenced its descent from flight level 350 and was handed over to Bangkok Approach Frequency. Approach then advised Qantas 1 that they would be landing on runway 21 left and there was an aircraft in front of them, Thai 414, which was an Airbus A330, which would be landing first before them. Due to the unexpected runway, 21 left instead of 21 right, the first officer then rebriefed the crew and noted that 21 left was a little bit narrower than 21 right and that the glide slope that the aircraft would be flying on would be slightly steeper. Normally there would be a 3 degree glide slope, but for 2-1 left it was a 3.15 degrees glide slope. This meant that the first officer would have to keep an eye on the speed and either change the thrust he was using or the configuration of the aircraft to combat the steeper approach. They also noted that they would be leaving the aircraft at the end of the runway to get back to the terminal, so the captain selected the auto brakes to position 2. Shortly after, Approach then recontacted Qantas 1 and informed them that there was heavy rain at the airport. The captain then changed the position of the auto brake selection to 3 and it said that this was for the water. They were then further advised by Approach that visibility was at 4 kilometers. This had no impact on the crew. The company limit on visibility for first officers flying was 1,500 meters and obviously 4 kilometers was way beyond this. The crew then got another update on the weather it was reported that the wind was from 280 degrees at 9 knots, visibility was now 5 kilometers, and thunderstorms with rain were in the area, and there was a thunderstorm over the aerodrome. The crew then had a discussion about the thunderstorm over the airport, and determined that it wasn't too much of an issue, they were still 70 kilometers from the airport, and it could have moved on by the time they got there. The crew then completed their approach checklist, and they had a planned landing configuration of flaps 25 and a reference speed at landing of 149 knots. It's worth noting that the Qantas company policy at the time was that aircraft at default would land with flaps 25 and idle reverse thrust. 
the 747 did have the option to go to flaps 30, which allowed it to land at a lower speed and also to use maximum reverse thrust. But both of these options increased the fuel burn and thus cost for the company. Qantas 1 was then instructed to change its radio frequency from approach to arrivals. They then advised TIE 414, which was the aircraft ahead, that there was heavy rain over the aerodrome and that there will be another aircraft, Qantas 1-5, a Boeing 747-300, which was going to land between TIE 414 and Qantas 1. Qantas 1 was then cleared for the ILS on runway 21 left. At this point, the aircraft was clear of cloud and not in any rain, but there was a visible storm cell over the airport. Again, this wasn't too much of a shock to the crew. This was a common occurrence in Bangkok, and they were conscious of the possibility of turbulence, wind shear, and reduced visibility. During the approach, the captain made several suggestions to the first officer to reduce speed, which he acknowledged and applied the speed brake to reduce the speed for this period of flight. At 10.40, TIE 414 then landed and reported to air traffic that they had good braking control on the runway. At the same time, there was a special weather observation taken at Bangkok Airport. The observation noted that visibility was now at 1,500 meters and the crew of Qantas 1 were not advised by the arrivals controller that the information code had changed. They were still operating under the belief that visibility was at 5 kilometers. The aircraft was now approaching 7,000 feet and the speed was decreasing below 250 knots. The crew selected flaps 1 and shortly after, at a speed of 207 knots, the crew selected flaps 5. The aircraft then intercepted the glide slope and continued to descend down the slope. Qantas 1 were then instructed to contact Bangkok Tower when they reached their final approach point, which was approximately 4 nautical miles from the runway threshold. At this point, Qantas 1-5, which was the aircraft ahead of Qantas 1, they were on their final approach for runway 21 left. They decided to go around 250 feet from the threshold, as the rain was so heavy they were unable to visually see the runway lights. This was transmitted on the Bangkok Tower frequency, however, the crew of Qantas 1 were still with arrivals and they did not hear this transmission nor were they informed of the go-around by arrivals. Just below 3,000 feet the crew then selected flaps 10. At a speed of 201 knots they then extended the landing gear. At 2,200 feet the first officer then disengaged the autopilot and the autothrottle as he wanted to manually fly the aircraft to maximize the opportunity for some hands-on flying. The crew then selected flaps 20 then at an altitude of 1,900 feet, at the speed 165 knots, the crew selected their final flap set in, which was flaps 25. And just a reminder that their reference speed, the speed they wanted to be over the threshold, was still 149 knots. They then passed 4 nautical miles to the threshold and switched to the tower frequency. Tower then advised them that caution, runway wet, and braking action reported by Airbus 33 is good. At this point, the crew of Qantas 1 were still unaware that the aircraft in front of them had gone around, so they assumed that the aircraft mentioned by the tower frequency had just landed immediately in front of them. They then continued their approach and carried out the landing checklist. At this point, the aircraft hadn't flown through any rain on their approach, and the crew were not concerned about visibility. They had been informed that braking control was good by the previous aircraft, so they continued with company policy of flaps 25 and idle reverse thrust on landing. At an altitude of 770 feet, the speed was 166 knots, and the first officer was heard saying that he doesn't want to slow down. The captain acknowledged this statement, but the speed was still within company limits and was decreasing, so there was no concerns at this time. At 350 feet, the first officer then called for windscreen wipers to be turned on, and the speed was 164 knots. He continued with his approach, and at 200 feet, they encountered heavy rain. The first officer could only see the approach and runway lights for brief intervals immediately after each pass of the wiper blades of his windscreen. The aircraft continued to descend, but then started to deviate from the ILS glide slope. The captain then responded by saying, you're getting high now. The first officer corrected his position. Then the captain said, you happy? And the first officer replied, uh, yes. At an altitude of 76 feet, in a speed of 169 knots, the aircraft crossed the runway threshold. This was 20 knots higher than their selected V-Ref, which was the speed they wanted to be at the threshold. The captain then stated, Get it down, get it down, come on, you're starting your flare. The first officer acknowledged this and also began to retard the engine thrust levers, 
in preparation for touchdown. The captain, seeing that the aircraft was floating down the runway and running out of braking distance, then turned the auto brake selection to four. The visibility was now getting so bad that the captain could not see the end of the runway and at 10 feet before touchdown, he told the first officer to go around. The first officer then advanced the thrust levers and began to go around procedure. The aircraft then touched down on the runway and the weather had cleared just enough that he could see the end of the runway. The captain then put his hand on the first officer's hand, which were now on the thrust levers, and pulled his hand backwards, bringing the thrust levers to idle. Unfortunately, the first officer's hand was only covering the thrust levers for engines two, three, and four. So thrust lever number one remained at takeoff. There was no verbal communication between the crew of the new decision, but the next words were the first officer saying, okay, we're on. And then the captain said, got it. The speed of the aircraft was 160 knots, but rather than decreasing under braking, it was increasing. Now the reason for this was that thrust lever number one was out of idle, so the ground spoiler did not deploy, and the auto brake system had changed to disarm, as it requires all the engines to be at idle to operate. Also, engine number one was also producing thrust. The first officer then noticed that the thrust lever was up, he brought it back to idle, the ground spoiler was deployed, and he started applying full manual brakes. He then responded to the captain's earlier question and said, yeah, I've got it. The aircraft was now at 153 knots, 1,625 meters beyond the threshold, which was halfway along the runway. And then the aircraft encountered its next problem. Because of the amount of rain that was now on the runway, when the first officer and the captain now applied full manual braking, it caused the aircraft to start aquaplaning. And this means that there's a layer of water underneath the tires. It's basically water skiing but this means there was barely any friction between the tires and the runway. So the aircraft was not slowing down anywhere near as quickly as it needed to. The aircraft continued down the runway, deviating from the center line before then regaining track. And the aircraft was now at 134 knots with only a thousand meters of runway remaining. The aircraft then entered the 100 meter stopway at the end of the runway at 96 knots. And then at a speed of 88 knots, the aircraft overran the stopway. It then continued along the grass and crashed into the ILS localizer antenna, causing the nose gear and the right hand gear to rip off and engines three and four to then dig into the ground. The aircraft then fell onto its belly and slid along the ground before then coming to a stop with its nose resting on the airport perimeter road. This was 220 meters beyond the end of the stopway of the runway. There were no serious injuries as a result of this incident but there were 38 minor injuries reported from both the crash and the subsequent evacuation. Now on the face of it, this incident seems quite simple. There was a crew that was unaware of the contaminated runway they were going into. They landed high and fast. And as a result of a little bit of poor CRM, the aircraft didn't deploy ground spoilers, which would have assisted with braking or begin auto braking under the system they had switched on. There was also no use of reverse thrust, either in idle or full reverse thrust. But there were several factors that led to this incident. It was quite a dynamic and evolving situation, but also an element of complacency and protocol, which led the pilots down certain paths. One of the main issues obviously being the crew not being aware of the condition of the runway, but also receiving information that confirmed their own bias. Yes, there was rain reported on the runway, but they'd equally just been told that the aircraft had landed in front of them had good braking action. Equally, the weather that they had at the time on the latest report that they thought they had showed that although there was rain, visibility was still at five kilometers, so therefore couldn't have been that heavy. But not being told of the updated weather and the go around of the Qantas aircraft in front of them left the pilots far less equipped to deal with the approach and landing. As we discussed earlier, it was also company policy to land as standard with flaps at 25 and idle reverse thrust. This led the crew to adopt their normal procedures without fully realizing that they required full reverse thrust and flap 30. It is fair to say that there was a slight breakdown in crew resource management. Yes, it was an extremely dynamic situation and lots of things were happening at once. But when the captain moved the thrust levers without any sort of verbal indication, this did lead to some confusion in the cockpit and subsequently meant that the thrust lever was missed. So the ground spoiler was not deployed and the auto braking was not used. This confusion with the thrust levers is also probably what led to the reverse thrust not being used, as the muscle memory and the standard procedure of the pilots had been interfered with, as they had to handle an unusual thrust lever setting, 
whilst in the landing roll. Now there was a fair few safety recommendations that came out of this incident. Qantas updated their simulator training program. This was to include exercises landing at flap 30 with full reverse required and other situations where the pilots would have to decide which one was appropriate to use. There was also a flight standing order issued by the flight operations branch titled landing on contaminated runways. There was also an update to the training of second officer procedures and Qantas updated its CRM training to reflect the latest worldwide research. Now there was many other points relating to the emergency evacuation that was carried out but that's far too in-depth to go through in just this video. There is another channel called Mentor Pilot who goes into that in quite a lot of detail. I'll leave a link in the description below. It's also quite interesting about what happened to the aircraft after the incident. So initially the aircraft was a write-off, but to preserve the reputation of Qantas, they had the aircraft repaired. The exact figure was never declared by Qantas, but it was believed to be around 100 million Australian dollars. This meant that Qantas could retain their record of having no hull losses since they started using jet engines. And it also might have been the most economical option as a brand new 747-400 cost about $200 million. So it might have worked out a bit cheaper. But the aircraft was fully repaired and eventually returned to service for Qantas. If you thought this incident was crazy, you're going to want to hear about the British Airways 747 where a passenger stormed the cockpit and started attacking the pilots mid-flight at 38,000 feet. Just click on this card now to find out more.